Community City Church, a church where real people like you and me can experience a real God as we do real life together. My name is Edwin, I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for the online sermon message. We do want to let you know that we are having in-person church services, and we would love for you to join us so that you can grow in your faith by getting connected to deeper spiritual community as we learn to walk with Jesus together and change the world with Him. We meet right at the Fairway School every single Sunday at 150 Cross Street in Malden, Massachusetts at 10 a.m. Come and experience God with us live and in person. And if you're unable to join us, we are so glad that you're here. We hope that today's sermon will encourage and build your faith as you see that God is moving in your life and in your circumstances. Enjoy the message. Would you please join me for our reading of scripture? Today's reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 and verse 8. Please follow along in your own Bible or with the scriptures on the screen. Again, that is Acts, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 and verse 8. Hear the word of the Lord. After his, meaning Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Looking at my life, I've noticed that the more self-reliant I am, the less available I am for God. And because I'm not available for God to speak into my life or to guide me in my decisions, the more self-reliant I have to become because now I have to be in charge of everything as I play God over my own life. I find that the more self-reliant I am, the less God is a priority in my life because I'm too busy managing all my other priorities as I focus on building my own empire as I meet all my goals, my comforts, and my needs. I find that the more self-reliant I am, the more self-centered I become. My ego gets bigger because I think I can do everything myself and everyone is there to serve my needs and my wants. And as my ego grows, I become more self-righteous, short-tempered, and judgmental. And maybe you can identify with what I'm saying. But this is the crazy thing. On the outside, it can look like we trust God because we talk about trusting God or maybe even go to church or serve God. But functionally, on a moment-by-moment basis, we know that we are really just trusting ourselves. Many of us can rush into doing things without talking to God first because deep down, we think that we know better than God because our source of trust is really our wisdom, our experiences, our resources, our connections, and our gut. And so, yes, I mean, we may pray, but because we are so self-reliant, our prayers really end up asking God to help us to rely on ourselves even more. Or maybe some are even disillusioned by God because of circumstances. For example, maybe you're struggling with an illness or someone did something to you in the past which still continues to affect you today. Perhaps someone in the church let you down or even hurt you and so you feel that God allowed these things to happen and therefore he can't be trusted. This causes many people to feel apathetic towards God and to see him as irrelevant in their lives all things that contribute towards continued self-reliance. And ever since the Garden of Eden we have sought our independence from God and his influence. We function as if we are the God of our lives thinking that We are wise enough to plot our own future and destiny. Well, until something goes wrong. And if people who claim to be followers of Jesus can function this way, maybe that is why those same followers of Jesus frequently feel defeated and are ineffective for God in the environments that they're in. Maybe that's why Christians can look godly, but live in a way that denies God's power and influence over their lives. Maybe that is why there is no distinction in behavior between the people who go to church and the people in our culture. Christians can lie just as much as non-believers, and instead of extending forgiveness and grace when there is a conflict, Christians are actually good at retaliation and grudge holding. Instead of listening and being a voice of reason and peace to our neighbors, we can be quick to speak, quick to be angry, and slow to listen. We're easily offended, easily busy, and easily put our priorities at the forefront of our lives while God gets our scraps, all things that contribute to us being spiritually apathetic. And is it possible that because of our spiritual apathy towards God and continuous self-reliance, we are not passionate about God or His purposes and have a lackluster commitment and attendance to the local church? Is it possible that we have replaced God with other idols in order to give us meaning and purpose whereby God has become more of an accessory that we use when convenient rather than our source? And because we are not frequently connecting and being transformed by God ourselves, it makes it hard for us to help those around us to be transformed by God. So it's no wonder people who consider themselves Christians are constantly stressed, worried, discouraged, and feel defeated with life, even though they claim to know God. And it is tiring and exhausting functioning this way, where everything that you trusted in starts to run out, 
Your reasoning has run out. Your resources have run out. Your wisdom has run out. Your strength and power have run out. Your solutions have run out. And whenever we face situations like these, we can either keep trying harder or thinking smarter, hoping that things will change as we hold on to our self-reliance, or we can take steps to seek and rely on God and have Him in His rightful place in our lives as we start changing the system of how we function and as we seek more of God. It's where we are discontent with our relationship with God and discontent with where our lives are going. It's where we now come to a realization of our need for God and our need for revival. You know, we're in the final part of our sermon series called Reliance, seeking God like never before, as we learn to go from self-reliance to now God-reliance through 40 days of prayer. And during this series, we've been seeking God for who He is, for the obstacles that we face, and for Him to move in, through, and around us. And our hope is that as a result, you are able to pray with more confidence and even greater faith than before because of God's power in your life. And the question that we will be wrestling with today is can real transformation take place in our lives and even in the lives of those around us? Can God do something to change the status quo of how we've been functioning and bring renewal to us and even to those around us? Because if we don't believe that God can bring change and transformation, then we will rely on other means to change us or the situations and people around us. But any change that comes from anything other than God will only be temporary and short-lived. Real and eternal change only happens when we come back to God as our source. Because revival only comes from God. You can't make it happen or will it to happen, but you can prepare yourself for when it happens. Revival means that something that was dead or close to dead needs to come back alive. It's where the person experiences resurrection power, which only comes from God. This power brings restoration, healing, and renewal to us, to our communities, and even to the rest of the world. But if anything is going to change, revival has to start with us wanting all that God has for us. Because only when we ourselves are revived by God, then can we bring revival to everyone else. When we are revived people, God's priorities become our priorities. And instead of focusing on building our own kingdom, we are focused on building His kingdom. When we are revived by God, our prayers start to become, God, do whatever you want. We want your will. We want your ways in our lives and in this world. And when we seek God individually and together, a small spiritual fire starts within us and within the group. And this spiritual fire begins to spread to others as they are revived from their apathy towards God. In the book Longing for Revival, authors James Chung and Ryan Pfeiffer research what revival looked like in history and landed on this definition for us to understand it ourselves. Revival is a season of breakthroughs in word, deed, and power that ushers in a new normal of kingdom experiences and fruitfulness. See, revival is not just one event. It is a season of breakthroughs that bring a momentum of what is possible with God as we experience Him moving in, through, and around us. This momentum starts to bring transformation and kingdom realities that go above and beyond what anyone could ask, think, or imagine. But in any journey of momentum, yes, there will be many great things happening, but do know that there will also be setbacks. But even in the setbacks, it is being resilient to trust God to still accomplish something greater in, through, and around us. And because revival only comes from God, revival starts with seeking God in prayer and then waiting on Him. And we see this demonstrated in the first century with the early disciples or followers of Jesus in the book of Acts. After Jesus' resurrection from the dead, 
He proved to the world that he wasn't just a mere man, but the God who came to save us from the curse of sin and death and to reconcile the broken relationship between God and humans. He presented himself to his followers over a period of 40 days. In fact, during that time, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Jesus gave people convincing proof that he was alive and he continued to speak about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, meeting his disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus told his disciples to wait for a gift. And this gift would be the Holy Spirit who would come and comfort them, guide them to know God's truth, embolden them and fill them with God's power to live like Jesus. In fact, the Holy Spirit is available to all who believe and receive Jesus as their Savior. Jesus knew that if his followers were going to make any impact in the world, they needed to be one with God because apart from Him, they would be able to do nothing. The work of true transformation was not going to come from self-reliance on our own efforts and power, but would occur only if we were relying on God and His power. Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If the disciples waited, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit's power would transform and revive his followers so that they would be his witnesses all over the world. They would be his image bearers all over the place as they reflected God's love and power for all to see and respond to. And so 120 of Jesus' followers waited in an upper room and they prayed for God to move. They were not going to move until God moved. Because if they were going to do anything of significance, they needed to be God-reliant. And it is in the waiting that they prayed. And it's in the waiting that they were praying for revival within themselves and for revival with those around them. And it's hard to wait on God, isn't it? Especially when God promised something but didn't tell an exact timeline of when it would happen. But they waited. And they waited. And they waited faithfully, not moving, just praying. And it was in praying and in waiting that God was working as he prepared their hearts for something greater. It was in the praying and waiting that God began to undo any self-reliant tendencies as he began to form God-reliant tendencies in them. It was in praying and waiting that his priorities would become their priorities. Because if the disciples didn't wait for God and just went out on their own to do what God wanted, they would have attributed any success back to themselves and not to God. But revival is the work of God. And if any transformation is going to happen, then it is praying and waiting on God first. And after praying and waiting on God, Scripture says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. God made his presence known to this group of believers in a spectacular way with violent wind, fire, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Here fire symbolized God's purifying presence which 
burnt away all the undesirable elements of our lives, like pride and ego and self-reliance, as it now sets our hearts aflame for God as we go out to ignite the lives of others. Each follower of Jesus was set apart and ready to display the wonder-working power of God. And as a result of this great work of God, the 120 disciples started to speak in other languages. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. These disciples begin to literally speak in other languages. And this miraculous act gathered great attention from those who were gathering in the city for the Feast of Pentecost. All the nationalities represented recognized their own languages being spoken. But not only that, these people saw the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, this was not something the disciples could have accomplished on their own. The Holy Spirit's power was made manifest to a great number of people that day. And in boldness, Peter, who was one of the disciples, shared the gospel with the listening crowd, resulting in the conversion of about 3,000 people that day. But this wouldn't have happened if the original believers didn't seek God first. Because how do we change the world with Jesus when we ourselves are not changed by Jesus? How can we expect to be an influence when we are not being influenced by God? Because only when we ourselves are revived by God, then can we bring revival to everyone else. So what about you? Are you in need of revival by God? Are you willing to make yourself available to God for revival? Some will say no, feeling that you are perfectly content, that you don't need more of God because you have things figured out on your own. Whereas for others, you may be saying yes. And if you are saying yes, then as you pray and begin to seek God in His time, He will bring revival to your life and to your environments. And we see how God worked when he brought revival to the same people who sought him. The first thing we see from revival is a season of breakthroughs. The event at Pentecost marked the beginning of the church as this community started to live holy lives that were set apart from the culture around them. It went from praying and waiting to a moment of transformation in that upper room to now a movement of transformation that affected everyone around them. In the chapters following this initial event, we continue to see a momentum of breakthroughs with the disciples, healing a crippled beggar, and then having the boldness to stand up in the name of Jesus to corrupt religious authorities. We see a supernatural intervention of discipline in the church community when a couple lied about money, and then an unprecedented move to equip and empower minorities for the work of the ministry. God was moving in, through, and around the disciples as the salvation of God was extended to all people, and as people's lives started to be transformed, and as churches started to be planted. Then, we see that revival results in word, deed, and power being demonstrated. Word refers to the gospel being expressed through teaching, preaching, and discipleship. Deed is the expression of the gospel by extending compassion and justice in the communities that the church was a part of. And power is the expression of the gospel in miraculous and supernatural ways. 
Arthur's Chung and Pfeiffer continue to say that word without deed or power could potentially lead to a privatized kind of faith or a dead legalism. A breakthrough in deed without word or power could become a social justice cause without explaining the source of hope or knowing the sense of its power. A breakthrough in power without word or deed can press into an excessive show of emotionalism or an unhealthy hunger for a heavenly experience that does no earthly good. When these three come together in love, they have a way of keeping a healthy balance between the expressions of the Christian gospel. See, it's when followers of Jesus understand God's word, serve those around them with the love of Jesus, and surrender their lives in order for the Holy Spirit to live in and through them, when word, deed, and power come together in love, revival happens. Third, we see that revival ushers in a new normal. We see this in how the early church functioned in a way that set them apart from the existing culture. We learn that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. These revived people lived differently. They continuously sought God in prayer. They studied scripture individually and together on a daily basis. They lived surrendered lives where they freely gave what they had in order to help other people. They enjoyed being with each other and doing life together. And as a result, this transformation of what God was doing in their lives was evident to outsiders watching. It was so set apart and different from the normal that people from the outside wanted to know more and became hungry for God. As a result, people came to know Jesus and the church started to grow. And lastly, we learned that revival ushers in a new normal of kingdom experiences and fruitfulness. See, the purpose of revival is to advance the kingdom of God. So we are revived and that spills over onto those around us. It is living out the values of Jesus and influencing the culture that is godless. See, revival is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling that I have for me to just experience with God on my own, thinking, hey, you know what? I'm good. Uh, I don't have to worry about anybody else. But rather, true kingdom revival by God should actually motivate us to not just think about ourselves, but even those around us. When we are revived... We now live into this new normal of kingdom experiences and fruitfulness. So we not only experience God on a deeper level, but now people are coming to know Jesus because of our lives. Families are changed. Marriages are changed. People are changed. Communities are changed. Attitudes and perspectives are changed. And people who were stuck in sin and are freed because of God's power in their lives. Our goal becomes bringing Jesus to people so that those same people who are dead in their sins and dead in their despair can now be resurrected to new life in Christ and be revived to experience life the way that God had intended for them. It is where we go and be that light to those around us. But it is only when we ourselves are revived by God, then can we bring revival to everyone else. And so what does it look like to pray for revival? First, it is praying individually because revival starts with personal encounters with God. Because remember, it is only when we ourselves are revived by God, then 
Can we bring revival to everyone else? A revival in your life always starts with you being serious and consistent about God, not being wishy-washy or making excuses. It is seeking God and surrendering to His Spirit so that you are ignited by God as you become a flame that He now uses to set others afire for Him. And in order to do this, we have to love God without schedule. You know, many of us will say that we love God or want more of Him in our lives. But when we look at our schedule, we don't make time for Him. We say we don't have enough time to pray, to daily read scripture, to join a life group, to serve, or even come to church on Sunday. But yet, when we look at our schedules, we see that we do have time. It's just that other things are a priority instead of God. Because the reality is that we make time for what is important for us. So when God is not a big part of our schedule, that already speaks volumes as to why we may not be seeing Him move in our lives and why many remain apathetic towards the things of God. So how can you change that so that you can invite God in for revival in your life? And it is when we are able to love God with our schedule that we can practice seeking God with the different ways that we have learned over these past 40 days, such as daily confession, repentance, or silence and solitude. It is through these consistent practices that we are now able to better surrender to God and cooperate with His will in our lives. It is making a daily choice to surrender and deny ourselves so that we can follow Him. It is letting go of the treasures of this world, letting go of our expectations of how God needs to work in order to accomplish our agenda. It is letting go of our bitterness, our pride, and our ego. It is saying, God, Your will is my will, as God now sets us apart for Him and His purposes. When we are surrendered, we go from living a life of self-reliance to now God-reliance. And when we do this, God will give us next steps where we can take that step out and step in faith in order to cooperate with Him as we become His hands and His feet in this world. And the second thing we can do in praying for revival is to pray for revival in the lives of other people in our community and in the world. One of the best ways to do this is by praying with others in community, just like we witnessed in the book of Acts. So if you are in a weekly prayer tripod, then perhaps it is considering to continue to meet together beyond this Reliance series. Or perhaps it is finding a group of people who can commit to regularly gathering and praying together with you. Another great avenue is to join the weekly Monday night prayer call as a hub to pray with others. And when you are praying together in community, it is praying for your family, neighbors, and friends. Pray specifically for God to move in them as they experience revival and break out of their spiritual apathy. Pray that they will be awakened to the reality of their sin and express their need for God. And know that God will move in mighty ways when we seek Him with other people for revival in those around us. Historian and minister J. Edwin Orr has made famous the statement, No great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. Christians persistently praying for revival. And all throughout history, we see that many great revivals started with a small group of people who came together with a burden for revival from God for themselves and for those around them. It is one thing to pray, but it is then also sharing the hope that you have with those around you. Once people begin to take notice of our change and revive lives, they will start to question this new normal. They will see the power of God at work and will be curious about our faith and the hope that we have. It is then that we are to share our hope in Jesus with gentleness and respect because it is when we do that, 
that people who are dead in their sins will now have the opportunity to respond to Jesus and be revived. Our job is to share the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit while leaving the results to God. Remember, it is only when we ourselves are revived by God, then can we bring revival to everyone else. You know, when I was a freshman in college attending a secular university, I got to experience and be part of a revival on our campus. At the time, I was still relatively young in my faith and I wanted to meet some friends. And so I knew Christians were nice people and so I decided to join the Christian fellowship group that was on campus. And even though I had a relationship with God, he was still just someone that I pulled out whenever I needed him in order to bless whatever I was doing. But as I started to attend this Christian fellowship group on a weekly basis, I started to be inspired by the faith of those who attended. I mean, these were college students who were committed to seeking God by studying scripture together, praying, serving, and doing life together. This was so shocking to me. I mean, college students doing this? Most of the college students that I knew were too busy partying or staying up late all night playing video games or just had other priorities. But it made me realize that God wasn't just a resource, but a source and someone I needed to pursue with all of my being. I knew at that moment that I wanted more of God in my life like those Christian students had, and I decided to join them in seeking God. And when I did, something happened. I got hungry for God, and my desire for God started to be unquenchable. I wanted to learn more about Him and I just wanted to do what he wanted for me. And I started to surrender more of my life over to him. In fact, I noticed I was changing for the better. God was reviving me and I felt a fire burning inside of me for God. And, and I wanted others to experience this as well. But the crazy thing was that God was not just transforming me, but the whole group of us. We started to not just think about ourselves, but God developed in us a deeper love for the rest of the students on campus who didn't know Him. We began to regularly pray for these people, that they would experience revival by God like we were experiencing. And opportunities happened for us to love people, to serve them, and to share our faith with our friends. And as a result, people started to come to know Jesus and follow Him. The more we sought God, the more we saw Him move. We saw people confessing their sins, stop using drugs and sleeping around and even drinking excessively. We saw people denouncing beliefs in other gods so that they could believe in the one true God. Relationships were being healed and lives were being transformed. People were hungry for God and they started to reprioritize their lives around the priorities of God. People began to forgive each other and let go of their bitterness and God's Spirit was moving in the hearts and making us more Christ-like and loving. And when you start living like Jesus and genuinely love people, the people around you will come to know Jesus. Lives were changing for eternity and many of these people have gone on to pastor churches and become leaders in the churches that they attend. In fact, some of these very people are even serving here today at Community City Church, making all of this possible for people like you in Malden to come to know Jesus and follow Him. All because of a group of college students committed to seeking God by praying for revival. Because remember, only when we ourselves are revived by God, then... Can we bring revival to everyone else? And revival always starts with the little few who are serious about God and who are ignited by God and who become flames for God whereby others can be set afire. So what about you? Do you need to be revived? Are you hungry for God or apathetic for God? Are you holding on to your own agenda or are you willing to surrender to God's agenda for you? Do you want your will, your way, your own life? Or do you want God's will, His way, and His way of life? 
Are you settling for your vision for your life? Or are you willing to surrender to God's vision for your life? So if you're going to pray, pray for revival for both yourself and for those around you. Do it individually and do it in community and see what God does. Because when he moves, get ready to catch it. Because if we are not available for God, we will miss that move. We can't create the wind, but we can create the sails in the boat to catch the wind. Because when we catch God's wind, our lives begin to make an impact for Him. Just imagine, if we prayed for and experienced revival in our church, just like the one we read in Acts. Imagine if our lives were used by God to bring hope to others. Imagine if we changed the world because we ourselves were changed. Remember, it is only when we ourselves are revived by God, then can we bring revival to everyone else. And when that flame ignites in us, we are now able to ignite the fire for God in others. Let me pray for us. God, we need you and we need revival in our lives. So revive us, O oh God, and transform us so that our lives can be used by you to bring hope and transformation to those around us. But it has to begin with us. And so Holy Spirit, move in, through, and around us as we surrender to your will and as we surrender to your ways. You know, as we continue in prayer, maybe you're hearing all this and you realize that you don't have a relationship with God and that you want one. You want to experience his revival and you want to experience his love and hope. You want to experience his mercy and forgiveness for your sins. Well, know that God loves you so much and that he came to earth as Jesus in order to forgive you for your sins and to create an avenue so that you can have a real relationship with him now and for all eternity. He lived a perfect life and he chose to die for your sins and mine so that we could have forgiveness and new life in him. And not only did he die, but on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, proving to the whole world that he wasn't just a man, but the God who saves. And if that is what you want, then I want to invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life, to save you from your sins, and to transform you into the person that you were meant to be. If that is your desire today, then will you pray with me right now saying, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all of my sins. Save me and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can follow you for the rest of my life. Help transform me into the person that you meant for me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you pray to ask Jesus to come into your life, then that means that you now have a relationship with the God of the universe and that you're part of his family. Please email us at info at communitycitychurch.org to let us know of your decision. And we would love to get to know you better and even give you some resources to help you to grow in that relationship with God. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.